This is a great occasion and of course uh, GAFCON is gathered around God's word. That is the reason why we exist in the first place. We are not here because we are against anything principally. Uh, we are not here uh, to oppose anybody but we are here uh, for the sake of the gospel. Uh, and so it is exactly right. Uh, that uh, we should give some attention to God's word. And I have chosen uh, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians uh, as our Bible readings uh, for this week. And I will uh, go through uh, a chapter at a time, which is why, is this, thank you, a chapter at a time, is that okay? Yeah, it seems okay. Um, so that we can consider properly uh, what, St. Paul is saying in this very important letter of his. Uh, but first of all, I just want to uh, give some summaries in Farsi and in, Eng uh, in Arabic and in also in Urdu so that people uh, may follow more exactly. So, Khalasa Dars Dar Zaban Farsi, Awalin. Shahar e Philippi, Awal Shahar Dar Tetai Urupa Bud. کہ اعلان انجیل آنجا رسید و نخستین کلیسیا اروپا برقرار شد دا شہر فلیپی مقدس پولوس این ایمانداران را خیلی دوست داشت چونکہ از ابتدا این کلیسیا در بشارت انجیل کما کے او کرد در این باب اول دو بار ذکر رفاقت و شراکت بے آنہا در دفاع و دعوت انجیل کھات او خبر زندانی اوداد اور سپاس گزاری برائے کمہ کے تازے از آن ادا کھات اور دن استخلاص فی اللسان العربیہ الفسہ من جوبہ مدینہ تل فلپی کانت مدینہ تل اولا فی القارت الاروپا ان وصل بیہا بلاغ الانجیل و قامت فیہا الکنیسہ الاروپیہ الاولا القدیس بولوس احبا المومنین فی القدیسہ لینہم سعادہو فی العمل الرسولیہ مندو بدا من ابتدا فی هذه الرسالة شکر بولوس للمساعدة المالية الجديدة من الفلبين وشجوع المؤمنين أن الرفاقة والشراقة مع الله أزوجال ومع الرسول وبينهم أيضا تو اردو میں بھی مختصر طور پہ کہ فلبی کا جو شہر ہے وہ پہلا شہر تھا جو کہ یورپ میں جہاں کلیس جہاں انجیل پہنچی اور جہاں پھر کلیسیا جو ہے وہ قائم ہوئی پہلا شہر اور پولوس اس وجہ سے اس شہر کو نہائیت ہی محبت کی نظر سے دیکھتا ہے اور اس لیے بھی کہ انہوں نے ہمیشہ اس کی مدد کی مالی لحاظ سے حوصلہ افضائی کے لحاظ سے جب بھی اسے ضرورت پڑی اور اسی لئے وہ بار بار ان کی تعریف اس خط میں بھی کرتا ہے so I have just been saying as you probably have gathered that the church at Philippi is the first church to be formed on the soil of Europe this is how the gospel came to Europe and uh, it is described in the Acts of the Apostles um, as the first city of Macedonia. Well, Macedonia has been in the news recently, of course, with this dispute between what is now North Macedonia and Greece about precisely what is Macedonia. Uh, but it is the northern part, I mean, for biblical purposes, it's the northern part 
uh, of Greece. And uh, you will remember what happened in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, in the 16th chapter at the beginning of the second missionary journey, uh, St. Paul uh, was prevented with his companions from continuing uh, to preach the gospel in Asia. And he had a vision, a roya, that uh, he should come and proclaim the gospel uh, in Europe. And so, of course, they obeyed, he and his companions, and arrived uh, in Philippi, where they found Lydia and some women, and they preached the gospel to them. And that is how the church began in that city. So, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, Philippi is called the first city of Macedonia. And people have said, well, Luke couldn't possibly have been right about this, because uh, the capital city of uh, Macedonia was Thessalonica not Philippi. So what actually did, does it mean when it says it is the first city? Well, what it means is that it is the first city in Europe that you come to when you cross the mountain ranges uh, and um, it is, as it were, guarding the entrance to Europe. That is why it's called that. Um, of course, the fact that the gospel came to Philippi uh, in this way and the church in Europe uh, began in this way is full of significance uh, for all of us uh, because the rest of the story of the church is to a very great extent uh, influenced by what happened uh, after Philippi as the gospel came to be at home in the many cultures of Europe over the next many centuries. Um, the Gospel, of course, uh, the Acts of the Apostles uh, records the movement of the proclamation of the Gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. And there may have been an apologetic purpose in St. Luke's description of the movement of the Gospel in this way uh, so that uh, the, the, the movement of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome, from the east to the west, if you like, uh, was to make it uh, a legitimate movement in the eyes of the Roman authorities. And as I say, the arrival of the gospel in Europe is, of course, a hugely significant uh, moment. But we should not forget that the gospel was actually moving in every direction. It was not just moving uh, in the western direction, it was also already in the Acts of the Apostles, we know how it came to Ethiopia, to the continent therefore of Africa. Uh, the other great superpower in those days uh, was uh, Persia. Uh, you know, you had Rome was one superpower, Persia was the other, and we have a record of the church in Persia uh, from very early days. So the gospel was moving then as it is now in every direction. But here we have the arrival of the gospel into Europe and um, the faith came to be expressed uh, in Europe, of course, in a European way. It came to be expressed, for example, in terms of Greek philosophy. So the Nicene Creed that we recite in our churches uh, so often is expressed in terms of the philosophical heritage uh, of the Greek people. Uh, that would not have happened if Paul had not arrived in Philippi. Uh, and of course we are very grateful for the way in which uh, Europe's cultures and Europe's ways of thinking have allowed the faith to be expressed in particular ways. But they are not the only ways. Um, so Athanasius, uh, uh, the uh, Bishop of Alexandria at the time of, uh, well after the Council of Nicaea, he was actually a deacon at Nicaea. Uh, but Athanasius was, uh, although Egyptian, uh, he was a wholly Hellenized Egyptian. 
He knew Greek, he wrote in Greek, he read Greek. Uh, and so uh, much of his theological contribution that he makes was, of course, in Greek. But his close friend, Antony, who was the founder of the monastic tradition, that is one of the great things that the East gave to the Western Church was monasticism, of course. Um, you know, they say, La Rahabaniyat Fil Islam, but in uh, Rahabaniyat Fil Masihiyat, uh, it also has to be uh, noted. Uh, so, uh, Antony spoke no Greek. He was probably illiterate um, and um, spoke only Coptic, uh, but established a great tradition for the church that is in no way an example of European culture in any way. Europe has received it, not provided it. Um, similarly, um, the, the work of the church that later and inaccurately came to be called the Nestorian Church in the Persian Empire, uh, spread all over Central Asia and right up to China, and into China, in, in fact. And um, I, I was doing some work on uh, the Silk Route, uh, because I was doing a lecture at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And I was amazed to discover how often the scripts of the Central Asian peoples were actually Aramaic, drawn from Aramaic or Syriac of the Nestorian church, because they are the people who reduce these languages to writing. So it wasn't just European missionaries in the 19th century who were reducing uh, the languages of peoples to writing. This had happened uh, much, many centuries before and in many other places. Philip is a very significant place for the continuing task of Christian mission, therefore. It is also a church which had a special place in Paul's heart. Well, of course, because of his missionary experience there, uh, with the women, with Lydia, uh, women actually feature quite a lot in this letter. And it seems they featured um, significantly in the church in Philippi. But Lydia is, of course, mentioned and the women with her. It may be that there were not enough men to have a synagogue in Philippi. You know, you need uh, 10 men uh, to found a synagogue. So the women had an informal place of prayer by the riverside. And it seems that these women were what you might call God-fearers, not formal converts to Judaism, those were called proselytes. But uh, in the synagogues uh, in the ancient world, um, there were, of course, uh, the Jewish people, there were the proselytes who had formally converted to Judaism. But then there was a penumbra. Uh, of uh, large numbers of people who were God-fearers, who were uh, attracted uh, to the faith of the Jewish people but had not formally become Jews. Cornelius is an example that we find in the Acts of the Apostles. And much of the success of the early Christian missionaries was amongst such people. You see, they provided uh, the constituency which obviously uh, had a point of contact already with the God of the Bible and wanted to know more and to belong in a way that they could not without first becoming Jews with the older dispensation. And so a great deal of what Paul says uh, about um, the need to uh, believe uh, and to be justified by grace through faith is addressed to these people who did not or could not maybe become Jews formally but wanted in some way to respond to God's revelation uh, in the Older Testament of course but also after Paul's preaching in Jesus Christ. Um, Again and again in this letter and in this chapter, uh, he calls, uh, he, he refers to 
his partnership in the gospel. In the title, I notice it says partnership and the gospel. But actually, it's not that. It's the, the words are uh, koenonia eyes to euangelion, the partnership in the cause of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel, in the movement of the gospel from one place to another. Thankful, he says, for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Uh, and then later on he says, you have become uh, partakers, again that word koinonia is used, with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and in the confirmation of the gospel. Um, For Paul, of course, this partnership had to do with the help that the Philippian church were giving to him, financial uh, and personal. Uh, it had to do with their prayers for him in his imprisonment. Um, but this expression, partnership in the gospel, I believe is an important expression for our gathering here. Uh, I'm sure that Archbishop Oko uh, and the speakers who follow will refer to this. Um, GAFCON is about a partnership in the gospel, for the sake of the gospel, for the spread of the gospel. And this is not just a partnership amongst us, the 140 or so here, or the 2,000 in Jerusalem. I mean, that was a very impressive sight to have 2,000 Anglicans in Jerusalem. That has not happened ever, I think, to, to get so many people together. Uh, very encouraging, but even there, it's not limited even to that number. It is not even limited to the Gafcon provinces. Uh, doing as they do constitute uh, the majority of the Anglican Communion. It is not even limited to all the Christians in the world with whom we have fellowship. I was once here, I think, with Bishop Azad over Christmas, and we were trying to get into a carol service in one of the churches here, and the place was absolutely jam-packed with people here in Dubai going to church on a weekday evening. It's a very impressive sight. But the fellowship is not even limited to that. See, we say in the creed, uh, I believe or we believe, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. You see, that is the extent of the fellowship. It is down the ages. We are in fellowship with the cloud of witnesses who bear a testimony to Jesus, to the spirits of just people made perfect. Uh, it is a fellowship across the world, down the ages, and rooted uh, in our commitment to God's word. I hope that uh, GAFCON in these coming days and in the coming months and years will develop a real partnership, which is a partnership in the gospel, not for the sake of convenience, not for seducing people into false belief and false practice, uh, not um, to exploit people for our own ends, but a partnership in the gospel such as Paul experienced with the Christians of Philippi. Paul um, <clears throat> here is uh, in chains. He is a prisoner, and so he is limited in his movements. We are thinking all this week of churches in restricted circumstances. Bishop Azad has already alluded to this, sometimes in very restricted circumstances. Just like Paul. Zinjir, he, you know, the Persian word Zinjir, which is also used in Urdu, and in Arabic the word is Qiyud. Um, where he is a prisoner, we can't say from this letter, though, uh, it has traditionally it's been thought it was Rome uh, 
Um, other people have said the distance between Rome and Philippi is too great to do justice to what is said in the letter because there are at least five or six journeys mentioned in the letter that people are making and it would take a minimum of about 40 days to make a journey to and from Rome. So they're saying it's too far, he can't be in Rome uh, with all these journeys going on. Well, uh, we can think about it. Uh, other uh, locations have been mentioned like Caesarea or Ephesus. Uh, the main objection as I see it to the other locations is that he is here considering the possibility of execution. Considering the possibility of execution. And if it had been anywhere other than Rome, of course he could have played his final card and said, I appeal to Rome. But he doesn't say that here. So it seems that the traditional uh, place is probably the right one, that he was a prisoner uh, in Rome itself. Um, in this uh, situation of imprisonment, he finds that the restriction uh, that he has as a prisoner is itself a reason for the spread of the gospel. This is a paradox, you see. This is the paradox. The blood of the martyrs is what? Is the seed of the church. He says here, by my imprisonment, the whole of the imperial guard the whole of Caesar's household, he says later on, has come to know the gospel. See? This would not have happened if he hadn't been arrested. You see? We would never have known uh, what uh, would have happened if Paul had not been arrested and brought to Rome, as far as the spread of the gospel is, is concerned in that way. Um, and it is not just his testimony that brings about the advance of the gospel, but it is an encouragement to others. You see, this is the point. It encourages others um, also to be bold and fearless uh, in their proclamation of the gospel. That is to say, the suffering church encourages us to be bold. See, and not to be fearful, not to be cowardly, but to be bold. Um, there is, of course, opposition. There always is. The opposition is from the outside. Uh, Paul says many times how he had fought metaphorically with the wild beasts. He could not, of course, literally be thrown to the wild beasts. You know that, as many other Christians were. Why not? Yeah, because he was a Roman citizen. Um, so he could not be. So it, it, his, this reference to the pressure from outside um, comes up again and again in 2 Corinthians, first letter of Corinthians as well. Uh, but there is also the opposition from inside. See, what is worse? Which is worse? Yeah. And of course, uh, we have experienced in our beloved Anglican communion the reality of this. Friends have become former friends, at the very least, sometimes active enemies. You see. Uh, people with whom we've sat and ate and worked do not now recognize us, look through us as if we are invisible. Um, so many of the things that we have cherished together, we no longer hold in common. 
This is a terrific tragedy. But brothers and sisters, we have not caused this tragedy. We have not caused this tragedy. At the time of the Reformation, it was said that the schismatic is the one who causes the schism. So we continue to hold fast to all that precious inheritance that the Anglican tradition has given us. You know, when people ask me, I'm sure they ask you as well, why are you an Anglican? And the answer is, because this is the way in which I have received the gospel. It is not the only way, of course. It is not the only way. But it is a valuable way which puts us in touch with our roots. With the passing on and the receiving and the passing on again of the apostolic teaching. So the opposition uh, from the inside. Paul is able to say here that he doesn't mind the opposition as long as Christ is named and proclaimed. You see, sometimes even with people uh, with whom we disagree, um, Christ can still be recognized as being proclaimed. I was listening to a radio broadcast by a very liberal bishop in England. And I have on many occasions um, uh, had um, encounters with him. Let's put it like that. Um, and he accused me of being a Daily Mail journalist, which is about the worst insult that you can <laughs> But that day on the radio, I did hear Christ preached by him, and I went to him and told him that. I don't think it has changed his fundamental orientation, if you see what I mean, but, but I think it, I had to be honest about that myself. So, um, he says, very difficult thing to recognize this, but this can be true, that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. When that happens. Paul um, is writing to the Philippians. He's sending the letter with Epaphroditus, who has brought him a gift from the church, and he is hoping that if he is released, and I do take that interpretation, that if he is released, uh, he uh, will visit the church once again in Philippi. He keeps going there. You know, he, uh, he likes to go there um, because he finds fellowship there. Um, this is an experience that we all have. We like to go and to be with Christians where we are united with them around God's word. And Paul certainly feels that uh, with the Christians of Philippi. But he knows that there are dangers lurking. There are people who are trying to distort the gospel even where he likes to go. There are people who are seducing others into a false way. And he is warning them about this. Now, before I end, there's just uh, one thing here that I would like to draw to your attention. Um, and that is uh, he speaks in verse 27 of the faith of the gospel. The faith of the gospel. Uh, we need to uh, distinguish, and this will be relevant uh, in some of the chapters uh, that follow, 
between the faith that is delivered to the saints, that is the content of what we believe. You see, faith is not just a feeling. It is not just an intuition. It is not just an experience. It is these things that have misled so many of our brothers and sisters in the rest of the Anglican Communion. He's talking about the faith that has once for all been delivered. This faith has clear content. There is a clear message, something that can be passed on down the generations. I know that Archbishop Ben is very concerned about Gafcon and the next generation, and the generation after that. We have to be uh, concerned about the next generation and the generation after that. But we need to know quite clearly what is the content of the faith that is to be passed on. So there is the faith that is believed, and there is also the faith by which is believed, you see. And that is, uh, the reformers uh, were uh, quite right to uh, put some emphasis on the faith by which is believed. It is this faith which by grace uh, justifies us, makes us acceptable to God. Uh, and it is this trust in God which enables us with all the difficulties and the problems that we face to live the Christian life day by day. But we cannot forget when questions arise, is this really a proper interpretation of the Christian faith or no? We can give a clear answer because we have a deposit. We have a deposit, the faith once for all delivered. If any question arises about this deposit of faith, if any question arises about that, you know, people say, this question about heresy can be settled in a whole number of ways. Augustine said, I believe because the whole of the worldwide church agrees. But then we know that sometimes nearly the whole church can fall into heresy. I mean, we know this from the Arian heresy. When Athanasius was left almost alone. So it can't just be universal agreement. How can we tell whether something is or is not part or is or is not an authentic interpretation of the one faith? That is when we have to appeal to the norm, to the norm of our faith, that is to say the Holy Scriptures. And um, I think it is actually a blessing that the Anglican Communion has been called back to this. Back from fashion, you know, we had uh, when um, in the English House of Bishops, uh, we had a, an Anglican theologian, liberal theologian, who spent a whole day with us uh, about the meaning of Anglicanism. And he said, I mean, to sum up the whole day, he's, what he was saying was the meaning of Anglicanism is good manners. Well, good manners, a polished liturgy, uh, wonderful hymns, these are not bad things, but they are not the sum of our faith. They cannot correct us uh, when we stray uh, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I thank God that Gafcon is calling us back uh, to the one way in which we can decide what is truly apostolic teaching and living for us today and what is not. Amen.